Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. This afternoon I'm looking at a book which has come to us from Oxford University Press. This book is, I think, of great interest at the moment because of the current political agenda with both the European dimension and the human rights uh, element included. The book is called Human Rights and Private International Law. It's been written by a number of people. James W. Fawcett, uh, Marie Nye Shula Bahan, and Sangeeta Shah. My apologies for any pronunciation uh, errors in the way I've pronounced the names. This is an excellent book from OUP. Um, it's part of the Oxford Private International Law series and I believe it's a very useful commentary on where we are today with both human rights and the issues of private international law as we reassess our role uh, post-Brexit uh, as part of the United Kingdom, its relationship with Europe and the rest of the world. Now, Elizabeth and I talked about the sort of review we would give uh, this publication, and the title of our review is Examining the Relationship Between Private International Law and Human Rights Law, the First Com Comprehensive Study. And that's exactly what it is. Now, let's have a look at the book. There's the book there. It's a hardback. You can see from that it's quite hard. There is the spine. You can see the names of all of the people mentioned. The book runs to quite a substantial number of pages, nearly 900. There's a very detailed index which you can see at the back, very much the house style of uh, the Oxford University Press. The index is paragraph numbered, so you can see from the paragraph numbering what you may be looking for. You can see again right at the back there's paragraph numbering and then a bit of footnoting. If you open the book in the middle you can see again paragraph numbering and the footnoting on the, uh, the bottom which is very helpful. So the case references and so forth. Now what we've got here is that's the front page and that's actually the Oxford Private International Law series listed uh, there, which gives you an idea of the wide range of publications. Then we have the preface, details here about the ISBNs, then the preface which has been written by the uh, editors, dated October 2015. Then you've got the contents section itself, which is split into uh, various chapters, uh, running through all the way, as you can see, running all the way through to the end of the book. And the book actually finishes at chapter 16. And most of the chapter headings, not all of them, have a conclusion at the end of each chapter, which I found quite helpful. Um, then after that, you've got the table of cases, setting out what, which cases. And they are actually split up into the various jurisdictions. So it starts off with the European uh, Commission on Human Rights cases. Then it has a whole range of other cases. The European Court of Justice, now Court of Justice of the European Union. Remember the name has changed. And so forth. English cases, British cases. Then you've got some uh, tables of statutes, of course, by jurisdiction. And then tables of statutory instruments, uh, which are also listed. And then you've got the secondary European legislation all of which is very important at the moment. These are the directives and the regulations. Then you've got treaties, conventions and so forth, all of which are directly relevant still and will be for some time to come, notwithstanding Brexit. Then you've got the abbreviations and special terminology which is used, because again, they do use a number of uh, different words. For instance, the Court of Justice of the European Union, which has been changed, the CJEU. Remember that particular amendment is important. Then you've got a whole range of other abbreviations all the way through, uh, running through to the end. Then you've got the introduction, that's chapter one. You can see with chapter one that you've got an index for the chapter right at the beginning, which is helpful. Uh, so if you're looking for anything specific, you'll find that very quickly. Then you've got the paragraph numbering and then you've got the relevant footnotes and that runs all the way through. It starts off with the themes of the book and the impact of human rights law on private international law. As I've said, I suspect with what has happened uh, in the decision in June 2016 of the British people to leave the European Union, we are going to have 
very substantial changes over a longish period of time, starting probably um, April next year, 2017, with the exit from the EU and then a complete review of the uh, Human Rights Act itself. I am aware that there is a Bill of Rights to replace the Human Rights Act, which has been produced and is prepared by the Ministry of Justice, but I don't think any of that is going to see the light of day in the immediate future because of what has happened uh, with the referendum. Now, let me talk about this book because I think it's a very important book and, of course, it is a leading authority in a brand new area um, as we approach the sort of middle towards the, the autumn now of 2016 and we can now reassess where we go uh, with what we currently have as the laws and what we're probably likely to get in future. This is what we say anyway. To those who might regard human rights law and practice and private international as separate disciplines, we would recommend this book. Its aim as the authors, that's James J. Fawcett, Marie Nye uh, Shulia Bahan and Sangeeta Shah explain, apologies for the pronunciation again, um, it's been, been um, intended to produce this first comprehensive account of the relationship between what are two pivotal areas of law. Quote, from an English law perspective. That's what we've got at the moment, and I think it's going to be valid for a few years until we know exactly where we are with the changes that are now uh, underway and uh, will be presented to the Westminster Parliament in the course of time. The result, of course, of this book, if nothing, is that, if, if not anything else, it's, it's innovation is as surprisingly close and important concerning the relationship between human rights law itself and private international law. In other words, the private matters which are directly relevant to our relationship with colleagues who are living and working within Europe. Because whilst they may be British citizens, they will come under a different jurisdiction. Taxation, of course, is one that comes to mind very quickly. Um, therefore, both human rights and private international are carefully examined and analysed both extensively and in some depth in what is only actually one volume. <coughs> now, the publication of this book addresses the question of whether private international lawyers, who primarily are concerned with commercial matters, should increase their familiarity with human rights law and vice versa. And of course, the answer here is obviously a resounding yes, except that the reasons and justifications as to why are not quite so simple to uh, understand. Indeed, it would take a whole book to cover this wide-ranging and complex subject. And of course, effectively, here it is now in 2016. But rather than functioning as a mere comparative study of these two areas of law, the book seeks to explore the linkages and overlaps between them. Quote, while the impact of human rights law is patchy, say the authors, and generally underdeveloped as an area of inquiry, consideration of the impact of private international law on human rights law, whether actual or potential, is almost non-existent. I suspect part of the reason for that is because the inquisitorial approach is not something that's particularly popular or new or something we, we wish to follow in our own jurisdiction. Partly that, and in fact I don't think people have really looked at inquiring in much greater depth to these particular substantive law areas. That's again why we've got this book on the market now. So the book, in other words, demands that readers should consider private international law not in isolation, but in the light of its influence upon and effect upon issues of human rights. Um, as I said, the book's been published by OUP, the Oxford University Press, and the title is a recent addition to OUP's Oxford Private International Law Series, and the general editor is uh, Professor James J. Fawcett, of course, who is the, also one of the book's co-authors. Interestingly, the book has uh, been researched and written thanks to a, an award of a fellowship from the Leverhulme uh, Trust. The result is a significant contribution to the study of this hitherto neglected subject area. And the book is reassuringly structured uh, for ease of use 
with numbered paragraphs throughout and a detailed table of contents and a, a, an index very much in the style of OUP. I think you will be able to find things pretty quickly depending on what you're looking for. With the exception of the introduction, which offers an English and European perspective, each of the subsequent 16 sections, that's the chapters, uh, features an introduction and a conclusion. Uh, researchers and academics will appreciate, we think, the extensive footnoting and the detailed tables of cases covering a number of jurisdictions and both the statutory instruments plus the table of secondary uh, European legislation plus the treaties, conventions and international instruments. So it's basically all there in, in the one handy volume. The authors have uh, said that the lawyers, as stated, as at October 2015, that's when they wrote the uh, preface and introduction. But as I've said, we now anticipate more than a few changes to the legal landscape over the next few years. The consensus seems to be, as I said at the beginning, uh, at the moment, that post-Brexit, the aim will seek to retain those measures emanating from the European Union that suit us. Uh, whilst discarding those that don't. And that would appear to be the uh, basis upon which we are going to review our uh, law, our various laws, uh, in the uh, post-Brexit era. Let me conclude by saying the role of the lawyer <coughs> excuse me, within this new dispensation will be a, to advise on the many legislative areas where European law has been incorporated into English law and it's assumed at the moment that the relationship between international law and human rights law is hardly likely to change in the near future and I think that's a, a reasonable um, assumption to make. Nonetheless we look forward to a new post-Brexit edition of this book which I'm sure will be on the market before too long. Let's have a quick look again at it. There it is. Heavy book, let's say. Hardback. Uh, nothing on the back, but there's the spine, you can see what it is. If we just open it up in the middle, I'm just picking anywhere. This is looking, the prohibition of discrimination and private international law. Right at the beginning, EU fundamental rights. And you see the structure again, paragraph numbering, and you've got footnoting, of course, all the way through. And a lot of quoting and justification. This deals with Article 1, Protocol 12 of the ECHR. And then we go to international defamation and invasion of privacy, always a popular subject area. So you see, they have covered in very, I think, in very great detail, everything you need to know. And I think we're very lucky to actually have this book available um, to refer to, bearing in mind the changes, the big changes that are taking place. So I'd like to thank all the contributors very much indeed for what they've produced here and to OUP for this excellent book. Thank you. Bye-bye.